Oh, hi, in this film I'm going to be making a nice dark blue belt and what I'm going to do is start with some natural russet leather and I'm going to spray it dark blue with leather dye. It gives it a very nice effect actually. I've done a few of these where I've done them in a, like a reddy pink colour, green colour and blue. I keep my russet leather under wraps to stop the daylight getting at it so that's why it's in a dustbin bag. Oh, uh, a lovely firm thick bit of leather this and I'm just strap cutting an inch and a quarter width there you are one nice strap as with all my belt making I'm using little templates I pre-prepare these and they give you the spacing for the rivets and for the buckle etc and just makes the whole process a bit easier and more accurate and you get better quality work. With the leather work all the time I'm sort of trying to drive the quality up so you, you're constantly on the lookout for little ways that you can improve quality and it's amazing how little in incremental things you can do to make a belt even better. So anyway, I will mark it out. And I'm just using a little all for the marking out. In case you're wondering <laughs> what the little yellow dot is, is so if you're doing hand saddle stitching and you're using an awl, you can line it up correctly. So that's really why that's there. Get your little triangle hole. So it's not a round awl, it's a triangular awl. Get your hole nice and straight going in. And at the same, you know, consistent angle each time. So I'm just curving off the end. So it just gives you a nice little rounded end on there and I'm going to do the holes next and I'm using one of these nice Dixon tapered punches. I do find these quality ones are very nice, they're actually easier to extract than cheap punches. This is a thick bit of leather. I should also really have my anvil on the corner of the table but as I'm filming it's um, easier to have it in the middle of the table then you have a chance of vaguely seeing what I'm doing. So I'm just skiving off the leather on the back of the belt here just past the buckle and this just makes it fit nicely so I'm just taking a little shaving off. and it gives you a tapered edge on there going down thinner so when you come to fold it over it rests nice and flat behind and doesn't look all bulky. That's my maker's mark in there. So next up I'm just rounding off the edges. Now to apply the actual dye I'm going to use a sprayer now one could use a wool dauber, but I find the, the problem with a wool dauber is it puts a lot of dye down on your leather at one go and you can get a very blotchy sort of appearance. So that's why I rather like these little mini sprayers and there's a mess of cable here today. It's um, cable and pipe. There's a little pump basically and so a compressor unit up here and a reservoir tank down here and the idea is you dial in the pressure you want it to take and the tank holds that pressure and gives you a nice even flow. It is worth getting these I think with the little tank underneath to get the consistent flow and then you have a little spray gun arrangement here so there's a little bowl and a little spray gun lever thing that you pull back to actuate. Bring that in a bit closer. So this is the actual spray gun bit, you put your dye in there and then you can press the little lever and out shoots the dye over your leather stuff. <laughs> That's the principle. It, it, it sort of works usually okay. Sometimes you get the old blotch or something doesn't go quite right, but it's worth keeping this sort of equipment really clean when you use it. Also, you do need to bear in mind just from a sort of health and safety point of view, do make sure you've got good protection on your lungs. So I've actually got, this is a fairly sophisticated mask, this one. 
is it an FP3 or something? It's one for vapour sprays, so it is the business end. Um, I wouldn't stint on the mask on this sort of work actually. I know you may sometimes think with my blacksmithing that I play loose and fast at times for health and safety, but I certainly, you've only got one pair of lungs. I know you say I only have one pair of fingers, but somehow get the mask. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's the, uh, the approach basically, and I'll be using the standard sort of leather dies that one sees around the place. Once again, I'm using one of my templates to mark where the holes go. So I give an inch spacing on the holes, seems to work quite well. And so that's just a sort of template that I use. So that's ready for punching out and putting a English punch on the end. I always like to try and get these holes as accurately done as I can. So I very often end up just placing the tool to mark the lever gently. And if you just place it gently on the lever, you get the tiniest faint impression and it's just enough to check that it's in center. So I'm using a smaller punch for these, it's a number 22. A slightly narrower belt. There we are, some holes. And I'm just putting the English point on the end, using my strep end cutter. So these come in different sizes, depending on the width of belt that you're using. So I'm using an inch and a quarter one here it's an inch and a quarter belt. But they're lovely bits of forging these. Nice bit of blacksmithing there. Cut a strip of leather and round it over to make the belt keeper. And I'm just going to again skive off each side of the centre so it nice sits nice and sort of snugly and flush. Find these little skiving knives very good actually. I have used round knives for skiving and I've used French skiving knives and uh, they're fine but to be frank when you're doing quite a lot I find these are very good. I don't need constant maintenance on the blade which is quite useful. So I'll soak that so I can actually bend it around the belt and to soak it I just spray it with a bit of water and to get the spacing correct I'll use a scrap of off-cut here and another layer, which is actually my template. And like that, I get the right sort of thickness. So just move it over that we need trimming off. And I want to put a couple of holes in there. So I'll just mark that. I'm going to punch out a couple of holes. shows in next. Just assembling the keeper. I do the keepers, you want them tight enough but not so tight. So I always check there's a bit of movement there. It seems about right. So I mark that for punching holes and then I'll put a couple of riv rivets in to secure the keeper. I always like the belt keepers to be strong because to me there's nothing worse than you get a nice belt and then the keeper fails at a later date. And so I want to be confident when I make a keeper that it's going to last as long as the belt does. So I always make them fairly carefully. I know some people do things like staple them together and to me that's a bit of a bodge. So a bodge in a bad way, I should say, not a nice bodger way. And so I always double rivet mine and that way I know they'll keep going for years and years and years. To smooth over the edge of this belt I'm going to use some gum track but you've, you've got to be terribly careful not to actually get it on the surface, on the front surface otherwise it will just become a bit of a mess when you come to do this, the spray dyeing. 
so I want the die to be able to sink in sufficiently. So it's a bit of a sort of compromise really between trying to get the belt edges smoothed off a bit and not getting everything so sort of spread around that the die then doesn't go on evenly. So I'm using a little cotton bud tip just to work the gum track along. You can obviously get it on the back of the belt, it doesn't matter at all, but the front face you want to try and keep as nice as you can. And then I'm using a new slicker, so there's not dirt on the slicker. And the idea here is really just to try and get that edge a little bit smoother, because it's obviously quite a rough edge as it stands. I, to an extent, I think you have to accept when you're doing the natural tan, you can't get your edges as polished as I normally would without getting stuff on the front face, which is what I'm obviously wanting to avoid here. So it's a little bit of a compromise. The other thing one can do is just using the edge of the slicker. Just gently make sure the lever's pressed down again. The slicking's quite a sort of laborious process in a way, because it's about 20 minutes or so to do a belt like this. But you do find if you keep at it, you'll get yourself a nice polished edge. And you can see the light catching that edge now quite nicely. For air brushing the die, I'm going to use my sprayer obviously, and I've mounted the belt onto a plank of wood. And I sort of use a combination of clamps, nails and double-sided tape. But the idea basically is to keep the belt flat against the wood, or reasonably flat against the wood. I'll come at it with the spray head on, and like that I'm trying to avoid getting dye on the back of the belt. So that's the sort of theory of it. So there you have it, one blue belt. And it's quite an effective way of actually getting the stain onto the leather nice and evenly. The thing you do have to watch is with the gum track, that it doesn't actually get on the belt itself and then block the stain. So that's the only thing. I do occasionally use Glaze Off, the sort of deglazing agent, if that happens, and just wipe it with a Q-tip and go along. So it is a bit fiddly. I have to say, making this sort of coloured belt is quite tricky, so not one for the faint-hearted, but it does give a very interesting effect, and I think with the colour you do get something far more than you do off like a commercially made belt. So it does look rather nice all in all. Thanks very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed seeing this film, and if you're looking for a belt, there's some lovely belts in my online store. The link's below. Thanks so much, bye bye.